This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. All right, so today we're going to the Alps. An innovative space rover with extended climbing abilities, Switzerland. Autonomous mobile robots have become a key technology for unmanned planetary missions. To cope with the rough terrain encountered on most of the planets of interest, new locomotion concepts for rovers and micro-rovers have to be developed and investigated. In this video sequence, we present an innovative off-road rover able to passively overcome unstructured obstacles of up to two times its wheel diameter. Using a rhombus configuration, this rover has one wheel mounted on a fork in the front, one wheel in the rear, and two bogies on each side. Here we can see the trajectory of the front wheel mounted on the fork. An instantaneous center of rotation situated under the wheel axis is helpful to get on obstacles. To ensure good adaptability of the bogey, it's necessary to set the pivot as low as possible whilst simultaneously maintaining maximum ground clearance. This architecture provides a non-hypostatic configuration allowing the bogey to adapt passively to the terrain profile. Motion in structured environments. For climbing stairs, it's necessary to have a good correlation between bogey size and step dimensions. We can see that the rover is able to climb regular stairs effortlessly. Motion in an unstructured environment. We also made some outdoor tests on rocky terrain. As can be seen, the rover demonstrates excellent stability on rough terrain. It advances despite a lateral or frontal inclination of 40 degrees and is able to overcome obstacles like rocks, even with a single bogey. In the next step, the robot will be equipped with adequate sensors for fully autonomous operation. So, it's quite interesting because when we think about uh, wheeled robots, we think about mobile platforms working in uh, indoor environments and it's really difficult to imagine these machines going around and being able to uh, like go over obstacles so we usually try to use what do we use in uneven terrain I mean what would be the solution the other solution the alternative solution Mm -hmm. Lagged. Lagged. So we always think lagged locomotion would be the solution. And uh, in fact, uh, lagged locomotion is very, I mean, adapted to those problems because now you can move each leg and go over obstacles. But in here we can see uh, a way that you, you in fact, uh, putting the, that uh, compliance uh, inside the structure and moving uh, the structure as you are adapting to the environment. So this is really a quite nice solution. But uh, there was also design that combines uh, legged locomotion together with wheeled locomotion. So you have a hybrid solution where uh, you are uh, using the wheels and pushing with the legs. So uh, there are several ways of even going further beyond just uh, modifying the, the chassis itself, going to uh, adding some uh, propulsion by the legs. So, uh, in fact, this project uh, was pursued further and uh, uh, I'm not sure if we will have uh, more videos on, on this one. 
Okay, so let's go back to dynamics and uh, I think today we will uh, finish uh, that portion of the, the lecture. I think uh, I emphasize dynamics. I also emphasize the fact that dynamics is very, very uh, closely related to control and we really need to understand those equations of motion in order to be able to control well uh, the, the robot. So let's go back a little bit to what we saw on Monday about uh, the Lagrange equations. We saw that we can describe the dynamic behavior of the robot, that is its motion, uh, it is uh, it's, uh, as a function of the torques applied to the robot through this Lagrangian uh, equation that involves the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So K is the kinetic energy and U is the potential energy. And we saw that because our potential energy is only function of the configuration, we can separate this equation and find uh, the structure related to the inertial forces and the forces applied to uh, the robot that is the gravity and the torques which means that we can uh, write the equation, put the inertial forces on one side and then analyze uh, the dynamics <coughs> that is the inertial forces dynamics and then see the effect of those uh, forces applied to uh, the system that is the external torques through the motors at each joint we have a motor and the motor is applying uh, a torque at the joint or a force at a prismatic joint and also the effect of the gravity that are coming so if we analyze this equation we saw that we can write it in this form uh, in the form of a mass matrix multiplied by the acceleration at all the joints plus some additional forces that are function of the velocity and function of the fact that the mass matrix is configuration dependent. And those forces could be obtained uh, if we express our kinetic energy in its quadratic form uh, expression that is one half Q dot transpose M function of the configuration Q dot. This is a scalar and if we do the derivation of the scalar, we find, in fact, that we have this equation. That is, this part will bring those elements, the mass matrix, the acceleration, and this part, which represent the centrifugal Coriolis forces. And we can see from this expression that when Q dot is equal to zero, this will disappear, or if the mass matrix was constant, this will also disappear. So, we saw the proof of this, I think that you remember. So, in this form, the equation now can be written in term of the mass matrix, the derivative of the mass matrix and the velocities, and the gravity forces equal to the applied torques. Because the mass matrix is this quadratic form, now we can, if we are able to extract the kinetic energy from our analysis of the different uh, motions of the links, we should be able to find the mass matrix directly from the kinetic energy. Then we put it there. And because V is solely function of the mass matrix and the velocities, we should be able to obtain V and that will give us the full equation simply by computing the kinetic energy. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do this analysis and find how we can find the mass matrix. And once we found the mass matrix, we will find V. And then G is a piece of cake. Okay. So how are we going to proceed? So here is an example of uh, an arm and we are looking at one of the joints, one of the links, link I. So this is a rigid body 
and this rigid body has a mass distribution, has some inertia, and has some mass. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at this kinetic energy associated with that specific link. And the idea is, if we are able to describe and find this kinetic energy, we will be able then to go over all the different links and do the sum and find the total kinetic energy. And because we have this relation, we can put the two together and we can then identify the total kinetic energy from the individual kinetic energies. So for link I, the total kinetic energy is going to be the sum of the different kinetic energies. So link I will be here, and when we walk through all the links, we are going to find different kinetic energies that we can sum and find the total kinetic energy. But then we will say the kinetic energy of the system should be expressed as a quadratic form on the generalized velocities. And the question is how can we then do this identification and extract M? So you see the algorithm? Just doing this part and then identifying M from that sum. All right, so I'm sure half of you remember the kinetic energy and the other half does not remember. So how we define the kinetic energy? Those of you who remember. So you have a rigid body at rest. And we move it to some velocity v. What is the kinetic energy? Yes? Yeah, but what does that represent? The work you need to, um, to move from rest to uh, velocity v. Yeah, uh, I, I think I understood what you mean, but could you repeat it clearly? <laughs> so everyone can. So it's, um, it's a work needed to move the spherical from uh, velocity zero to... From rest to its current uh, state. Yes, that's the definition. So it's the work done by the external forces to bring the system to its state from rest. And that means we are going to take a look at this point mass and its final velocity, V, and that work will come to be one-half mv square. Now, this is for a point mass, but we are working with links. And links are rigid objects, right? And they have rotational motion, and which means each of the particle is moving at different velocity, etc. And there is a, a quantity that allow us to evaluate that inertial forces generated by those particles. And this is the inertia. So the inertia of the rigid object is going to intervene now if we look at rotational motion. So the kinetic energy associated with a rigid body whose inertia is IC, C here represent the inertia computed with respect to the center of mass as we have everything is represented at the center of mass will take this rigid object from uh, rest, the zero kinetic energy. When we reach omega, there will be some kinetic energy and this kinetic energy is going to be you. <laughs> What half? Omega transpose in the inertia. Inertia. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if this was just uh, um, one degree of freedom, this would be basically a, a scalar i representing the inertia about that axis, omega square. But we, we are looking here at a spatial motion. So i is a matrix, and uh, the omega is a vector. So we need to write it in this form. Okay? So 
if we take this rigid body and put to it together V and omega, <coughs> that is, it is undergoing both angular motion or uh, rotational motion plus linear motion, then the two will combine and the total kinetic energy will be the sum of these two kinetic energies. Okay? We're clear about... This is very important. Once you understood the kinetic energy, you have all the dynamics. The rest is just, uh, just uh, uh, math, basically. So you understand this for one rigid body? Good. Then we're going to be ready. We just tried this. All right. Now pay attention. From here we're going to find the dynamic equations of a multi-body articulated system directly by, by summing these K, Ki's. If you understand this, you will see immediately that M is going to emerge this mass matrix for all the structure. So the kinetic energy of one link is this sum combining the kinetic energy associated with linear motion and the kinetic energy associated with angular motion. And let's do the sum. So the total kinetic energy is the sum and I'm going to write it. Just uh, to remind you, we have selected for this structure, we selected a set of generalized coordinates, Q. And that means we have a set of generalized velocities, Q dots. So these are the minimal number of parameters or configuration parameters needed to represent this configuration. Once Q is defined, the configuration is locked, right? So now we can say, because we know these generalized coordinates and generalized velocities, we can say the kinetic energy is also this expression of half Q dot transpose M Q dot, where M is this positive definite symmetric positive definite matrix that appears in this quadratic form. So we have these two different ways. The first one is here we are saying we can compute individually the kinetic energies without worrying about the joints, the connections, the constraints, right? We are just going and looking at every link and we are evaluating its kinetic energy and saying the total kinetic energy is going to, the, to be the sum without even thinking about what type of joints we have. Now we are saying if, if we write the expression as a function of the generalized velocities, we have this expression. And the two are equal. It's the same kinetic energy. Are you still following here? Good. And this is the key. Now we are going to identify this expression with the sum obtained by the individual links. And somehow we are going to like work a little bit here to come up with this mass matrix. Okay, so now help me. What is needed in here in order to, to extract M and find its expression? So I heard Jacobian. <laughs> oh, it, it, that's correct. Yeah, you need I, to translate the velocities to uh, joint space. So, in the left-hand side, we have half, and here we have half, right? In the left-hand side, we have Q dot transpose Q dot around the M. In here, we have V, C, I, the linear velocity at the center of mass of each of the links, the, and 
the angular velocity at each of those links. So what you are saying is we need somehow to express these VCIs and omega i's as a function of q dots. And if we do that, then we can say, we can put it in an expression similar to this and extract m. Is that a good way? You all agree? Should we do it? Why not? You have it in your hands, but let's do it. Okay. So, to do this, we are going to use the Jacobian. And what we need to do is somehow to come up with a Jacobian. This is not the same Jacobian we talked about before. That is, if we look at what we developed before, we developed a Jacobian at this point. You remember? At the last link, we had a Jacobian that allow us to compute the linear and angular velocities at this point. And these were called what, those Jacobians? We had two Jacobians. Anyone remembers? Before the midterm? JV, which is the Jacobian associated with linear motion, and J omega, oh, so easy, J omega. <laughs> J omega, the Jacobian associated with angular motion, right? Okay. So, but this was defined here at the end of factor, and this was the velocity r corresponding to the velocity generated by all the Qs, all the Q dots, right? But now I'm talking about the linear and angular velocities at this point. So it's not going to be this VCI is dependent on which velocities? Q dot 1, Q dot 2, 2, Q dot I minus 1 or I, we're not sure. Uh, well, you see, we are at VCI, which is the center of mass of the link. So, Q dot I is just before. So, it is dependent on up to Q dot I. Okay. All right. So, I, I will define it later, but essentially we need to come up with a Jacobian that will capture all these Qs, because I need Q dot at the end. I don't want just to go from Q dot 1 to Q dot I. I need to be able to write this matrix so that I can multiply it by Q dot. So we will define JVI in a bit, but we need a matrix like this. You agree? What about omega? Well, omega is going to be in the same form. We will have another matrix. We call it J omega i. This is different from J v and J omega. When we say J v and J omega, we mean the Jacobian associated with the end of factor. When we put the i, it is really related to the velocity at that specific one. Okay. All right, now let's go and plug this in, this equation. So now you substitute VCI with JVI Q dot and the transpose of that. So the Q, what is the transpose VCI transpose would be? Q, Q dot transpose. J, V, C, I, transpose. So when you do this, you're going to have the transpose of Q dot tra here, the J, V, I, and the J, V, I coming from the V, C, I, and the same thing for the omega. All right, we're almost there. You're going to see the mass matrix emerging.
someone can help with the next step? We're almost there. I, actually, some of you already see what is M, but let's, let's, uh, what do we need to do? So we, we notice this I, we have an I here, we have these I's, but this, these Q's are independent of the sum, so we can take them outside, right? And that's it. Do you see the Jacobian in the mass matrix? Do you see the mass matrix M? It is quite amazing. Your mass matrix is simply those Jacobian transpose Jacobians scaled by your mass properties. That's it. So all what this mass matrix is, is just to take the Jacobian associated with those specific points of the center of mass and see their impact on the velocity because they are capturing the effect of the velocity and you are scaling them by MI or ICI. So, if your robot was one degree of freedom, so I will be one, basically this would be M1 and JV, JV1 transpose JV1 and that will be the inertia of that first link. Now, if you have multiple links, what you can see is, you can see that the Jacobian matrix of all of these links are going to contribute, so you can think about this as the sum of M, M1, M2, M3, Mn, and you can see the impact of each of the links on the total mass matrix. So, we, we will take an example a little later, but you can see how each of those links is going to affect the mass matrix. And as we propagate and move from one link to the next, we are capturing the inertial properties coming from the lower joints and moving down to the end. So that is your mass matrix, and now the rest is really computation, just getting uh, this uh, V vector from the partial derivatives of the mass matrix. That's it. By the way, uh, I still haven't defined what is JVI. It is, uh, I said, this is the Jacobian associated with that center of mass, and I think we need to define it more carefully. So in order to be able to capture JVI at the center of mass we, and, and express it as a function of all the Qs, what we're going to do is we're going to take this vector locating the center of mass and taking its partial derivatives up to the point QI. So this is column I. And every column after that will be zero. So by definition, this matrix is the Jacobian matrix computed with this vector PCI and up to this point and then we are adding those zero columns. Okay? So what about uh, J omega I? What would be J omega I? Without looking at your notes. J omega used to be what? Epsilon I bar Z1 Epsilon 2 bar Z2. So we will do the same thing up to ZI and we add zeros, columns. Okay? So now you know this definition of JVI, J omega I, and now you can compute this. Okay, you already have the DH parameters for the Stanford Shaman arm. Let's compute the mass matrix. You have 10 minutes. <laughs> no? 
Well, it will take more than 10 minutes, I'm sure. So uh, I will take an example of two degrees of freedom. In fact, before even going to the example, let's, uh, let's do something, uh, something uh, of uh, just uh, the analysis of this mass matrix we talked about. So I'm not sure if you, you really uh, see what is in here, but when you think about this mass matrix, as I said, it is uh, sort of like symmetric, positive, definite, and it has a lot of properties, and you can connect those properties to the structure of the robot. So, first of all, let's see what M11 represents. M11. So, I have a robot. I'm going to use my arm to illustrate it, if you can have. So this is the first joint, rotation about this axis. And this is the second joint. OK, so it's in the plane. So could you tell me what M11 represent? So let's take this manipulator and lock it. It is one link. The whole thing, we lock it, right? And I'm going to rotate about this axis. So I apply a torque, there is an acceleration. Basically, inertia time acceleration equal the torque, right? In that case, just one degree of freedom like a pendulum, the inertia of the pendulum. So, so that inertia of the pendulum is captured where in this matrix? Can you see it? No, not yet? It is M11. M11 is representing this inertia. Now, this inertia is function of what? Of the configuration. So if I change this configuration like this, I'm going to change the value of M11. If I move like this, it is lighter, heavier. OK? OK, M22, the same question. It represents what? Oh, come on. We did M11, so M22. So if we, if we lock all the joints after M22, uh, I mean after joint 2, M22 would represent what? So it is really the inertia perceived at joint 2. So all these diagonal elements are representing the inertia perceived, the effective inertia perceived at each of the joints. OK? Let's go to M and N. Hey, wake up, come on. M and N is this last link, OK? So this is representing the inertia perceived about this axis, right? It's function of what? So this is link N. And uh, it is not uh, really my hand. It is just a constant link. It's a rigid body. It cannot move. So MNN is representing that perceived inertia and its function of which variables? I'm sorry? <coughs> it is the last joint coordinates. Okay, everyone agrees with him? Okay, those who agree with him, please show your hands. One, two, you are in minority. Democracy <laughs> take over, so <laughs> it's not correct. Actually, in this case, uh, it's really uh, the law of, of physics that are going to play. And uh, the law of physics says that if I'm moving one link about some axis, 
So it is the case of this link, everything is locked, and the inertia is, could you tell me, if it's function of anything, except the weight and the inertia uh, mass distribution on the link? So it's constant. So MNN should be constant. It's not function of the QN. But thank you for, for just making uh, the point uh, to make sure that we, we emphasize this. Uh, MNN is not function of the last link, uh, last joint, it is constant. <coughs> now, the question to you, the previous joint, the previous joint here, well, let's take this one. So you can see that previous joint, the inertia is going to depend on the joint so, so MN is constant. The previous joint will depend on the next one, right? And as we move, we see M22 is function of what? M22 is going to be function of all the joints that are following. So, the robot, if we think about M11, is M11 function of joint one? No. M11 will not be dependent on the configuration of joint one. Wherever M Q1 is, the inertia depends only on how we're displaying the structure. So the following joints. Everyone sees this? Good. You're saying it's just constant. No, M11 is function of what? I'm not saying it's, it's independent of the first joint. Because as I move this around, if I fix all the other joints and I move about this, I'm not changing the inertia about this axis. But it's function of all the following joints. So, M11 is function of what? Q2 to Qn. M22 is function of Q3 to Qn. And the last one is constant. Okay. There are a lot of interesting properties about this matrix. What is the relationship between M12 and M21? Identical. It's symmetric. If, if you have a robot, one degree of freedom robot, M, N, N, <coughs> and you model the mass matrix of that robot, and then you hook it to another structure, well, when you find the total mass properties of that structure, the MNN is exactly the same that you computed for that robot. So if I take, if I take this structure, a robot with joint 2 to joint N, with its mass properties, I find the mass matrix of that robot. And now I attach this robot to an additional joint. Look what happens. In the new mass matrix, you will find the same block, the same matrix is completely inserted here. And what you are adding now, you are adding the mass matrix, the mass properties perceived by this joint, but immediately you are creating coupling. You are creating this coupling between the first joint and each of the joints of the structure you are adding. So, M12, M12 is representing the coupling between the acceleration of joint 2 on joint 1. M21 is the opposite, joint 1 on joint 2. So, think about this if you multiply this matrix by Q double dot. Q double dot 1, it will be M11 Q double dot 1 plus M12, Q double dot, 2. All of this is going equal to torque 1. 
so the first equation is the dynamics of the first joint and that dynamics of the first joint if you try to imagine what that equation will be it will be m11 q double dot one plus all these coupling accelerations equal torque one so when you have just <coughs> locked joints you have m11 q double dot one no accelerations here but as soon as you re relax the lock and leave it away as you start moving this is going to produce coupling forces you see that okay what does it mean that m is positive definite Is the answer has to be greater than zero unless q dot is identically zero. Very good. So that is physically you cannot talk about an object with zero mass, right? So the object has to have a mass, and a mass is always positive, right? If you have a particle of, with some mass, it is always positive. Now, when we go to articulated body systems, it's the same property, but it is in a matrix form. And this M has to be positive all the time, whatever. So if we think about the kinetic energy, it's one half Q dot transpose M Q dot. Well, the kinetic energy is always positive, right? Or zero, if we are at rest. If we are at rest, the Q dots are zero. So the quantity k, one-half q dot transpose m q dot, is going to be positive and zero only if q dot equal to zero. Okay. okay. To discuss the, this v vector, I'm going to simplify the problem and we're going to analyze it with two degrees of freedom. I think that will make it a little easier, but not completely easy because what we need to do is now little bit of computation using Lagrange equations going to those vectors we computed m dot q dot minus this big vector uh, all of these computations you do them once forever and then you know the structure and then that's it but w w I, I want you to understand where those equations are coming from so we are going to analyze it on this okay so this is a two degree of freedom manipulator. And now I'm writing these equations for two degrees of freedom. So you can see here, what is the first equation? Could someone re 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 uh, read the first equation for me? You have two equations here, right? This is one vector equation that you could write in two equations. So could someone read the first equation? M1 to Q double dot 2 plus V1 plus G1 plus tau. So the first equation equal torque 1 the represent the dynamics of the first link. The second equation represent the dynamics of the second link. If we lock the first, the second link, M11 Q double dot 1 plus V1 plus G1 equal torque 1. If, if the second one is moving, there is coupling coming from Q double dot two on the first one, and the opposite is on joint two. So what I'm going to do is to compute the V, okay? We're going to compute V1 and V2, and we are going to do this by going to, by going to the equation of V. This is, uh, scary equation but don't worry it's all there if you remember when we did the the computation of the kinetic the derivative of the kinetic energy we came up with v equal m dot q dot minus this vector you remember that right everyone remembers so basically v is is simply m dot q dot minus one half the first element is q dot transpose m q one 
and MQ2. What does it mean, MQ1? Well, MQ1 is, means that this is the matrix, the mass matrix. All the elements of that matrix are taken as derivative with respect to Q1. And the second one with respect to Q2. So I'm rewriting this equation here in more explicit way. I'm saying it is m dot. So what is m dot? It is the derivative of the element of the matrix, right? You agree with this? And what is mq1? mq1 is the partial derivative of m11 with respect to q1, m12 with respect to q1, basically the matrix with respect to q1. So I'm writing m11. So it is partial derivative of 1, 1 with respect to 1. Okay? And here with respect to 2. Okay, uh, do you see this notation? Basically, the notation is saying the element 1, 1 is taking here partial derivative with respect to 2 or to 1, depending on the variable, the last element. Okay? So, we just rewrote V. Now, for M, the time derivative of M11, we will write it in this way. We write the time derivative of, of M11 is the, the partial derivative with respect to 1, Q.1, and the partial derivative with respect to 2, Q.2. <coughs> you agree? These are the, the only variables that are involved in, in the Q. So I'm just expressing, expanding a little bit this equation, all right? Okay, so this is just rewriting the equation, and now we are going to, uh, this is a little bit more about what is 1, 1, 1. It is partial derivative of m11 with respect to q1, partial derivative of 2, 2 with respect to q2, etc. So let's rewrite this. And if we go further and develop this computation and rewrite it, so this is how it comes. If we write the V vector, we can develop it as the sum of these two terms. So, I mean, from the top there, you can see that the vector is involving velocities, product of velocities, q dot 1 multiplied by q dot, the vector q dot. So it will result into product of velocity q dot 1 square, q dot 2 square, and q dot 1, q dot 2, right? And we are grouping all of these in this form. So this is the answer. I, I'm just doing it for saving time. You don't have to do it. So this is the answer. What is V is as a function of those partial derivatives and the velocities. Okay? Do you accept that? I mean, you, you can do it, but basically you can, in fact, you, you might be surprised why I'm writing plus M121 minus M121. <laughs> writing there 11 one plus 11 minus 11. <coughs> It is a really interesting form. But what it turned out is that under this form, there is some pattern that is taking place. And if we look at this expression, this expression has a pattern that is repeated all the way. And when we go to n degrees of freedom, we find this pattern over again. So it's sort of m, i, j, k with permutation, first element plus, minus, and there is a permutation involving those three elements. So, this expression is going to help us find, finding those matrices that are, are going to scale the velocities, the product of velocities. That is, if we think about two degrees of freedom, we have square of the first velocity, square of the second velocity, and product of the two. 
but if you go to like six degrees of freedom you have the square of all the velocities and many product of velocity q dot one q dot two q dot one q dot three to q six and you have all of these so we can always put them in term of matrix multiplied by the velocities square of the velocities and matrix multiplied by the product of velocities and always involving those elements anyone knows what this represents Well, Sir Christopher discovered uh, this pattern and we call them the Christopher symbols, the B, I, J, Ks, that we can form from combining the permutation of uh, the partial derivatives of M, I, J. So you start with an element M, I, J and you take its partial derivative and then you form these uh, symbols. A Bijk is one half the element Mi Ij taking with respect to K and then Ik taking with respect to J minus Jk taking with respect to I. Well, so this is the first element and using these symbols we can simplify the writing of what we saw here these two matrices and write them in this form. So you have a matrix multiplied by Q, the square of the velocities and another matrix multiplied, a column matrix in this case, multiplied by the product of velocities. When we go further, this will generalize and this matrix is function of Q, we call it C. This is the centrifugal force matrix because this matrix is multiplied by the square of the velocities and B is the Coriolis matrix and this matrix is multiplied by the product of velocity and this generalizes in this way it's for n degrees of freedom so the centrifugal force matrix is this matrix that when multiplied by the square of the velocities gives you the centrifugal forces and the Coriolis force matrix, when multiplied by the product of velocities, give you, gives you the vector B Q dot Q dot V. Symbolically, we, we put it this way. This will give you the, sun, uh, the uh, Coriolis forces. So, the C matrix, centrifugal force matrix has to be of dimension what? How many square of velocities we have? We have Q dot. How many Q dots we have? N. So how many, how many squares? We have N square of velocity. So this matrix will be an N by N matrix. Okay? This matrix B, how many Q dot Q dot, how many product of velocities we have beside the square? Well, it turned out we have N minus 1 times N divided by 2 mul basically a column. So for 6 degrees of freedom, this is what? 5 times 6 divided by 2, which is? 15. So if you go from 1, 2 to 1, 6 and then 2, 3 to the end, you have a long vector of product of velocities. How many rows we have here? The dimension of V is always going to be 6 or N. So we will have always N rows. So you have more columns. How many columns? This is the 15 columns for 6 degrees of freedom. So this is a wide matrix multiplied by this long vector to produce your, uh, your Coriolis forces. The Coriolis forces are B multiplied by Q dot Q dot. And C also has N rows, but it is square matrix. 
Okay? So we can compute V simply by finding the Bs, and these Bs are simply a function of the partial derivatives of the element of M. Once we computed M, we just do this differentiation and do the computation. Very simple. Well, very simple if you're not doing it by hand, but if you're doing it by hand for n degrees of freedom, it's complicated. But, but let's, let's take an example in, in two minutes, and you see it's not that difficult for a few degrees of freedom, and you get the, the sense of it. Okay, you get the idea here? I mean, the main idea is to remember M gives you V, and V is obtained by two matrices C and B, and these matrices are involving element that are the partial derivative of, of M. And that's why if M is constant, everything here is zero. So if the mass matrix was constant, there is no centrifugal Coriolis forces. Okay, uh, one more thing left is the gravity. I mentioned the gravity, uh, and we need to deal with the gravity. So, how do we compute the gravity? So, you, ha you, have, you have each of the links somewhere, and you have the center of mass, right? And, and as you move up and down, you have different potential energy, right? Higher, better. So, the height is very important. And you can compute the height so, and then compute the potential energy of your specific link. And then you add them together. So, the potential energy for, uh, to compute HI, you have a vector. We, we already found this vector locating the center of mass. We have the height. We have the gravity pointing south. So we take the minus gravity vector, we multiply it by the PCI with that product, we compute H, and that gives you MI. Now, what is the gravity forces? Well, it is just the gradient of that. You just take uh, the partial derivative with respect to Q, and you find it. And what is the partial derivative gives you, usually? Gives you the columns of the Jacobian matrix. So essentially, your gravity is simply this minus multiplied by the JVI's times this vector, M1, M2, to Mn. Actually, a very simple way to think about it is, let's, let's look at it this way. You have this manipulator, you have all these links, and you have the center of masses. If you are standing like this, it's almost like you are, at each of the link, you have a force pulling you down. And you are trying to compute the torque corresponding to that force. So what is the force pulling down? This is the mass of that particular joint multiplied by the gravity, right? Everywhere. Like this. Right? You have weights. So what is the torque corresponding to this? So let's start with the last one. The F, what is the torque? Torque equal J transpose F. So J transpose, in this case, V, N, F, which is M, N, G, right? Just add them all together. And how? And now you have your gravity. Okay? So now we know the gravity, we know how to compute V. Let's take an example. Okay, this is, uh, do you see this robot? Uh, it's a little bit, uh, I'm not sure, can you see it? So this is a two degree of freedom robot. And the first joint is Revolute. What happened to your voice? Come on. The second joint is? Oh, yeah, that's better. All right, so we have a Revolute prismatic joints. 
to simplify to really uh, so what we are doing is we are selecting we are selecting uh, this point and representing the end factor at this point so this d2 is measured from here to here okay I mean we are not putting it in here we are putting it at the center of mass and uh, we are looking at a first link that has a mass of m1 a second link of m2 and inertia tensor of IC1 at the center of mass and IC2 we are locating the the vector PC1 by this distance from uh, the the origin and the origin located here at the axis so x1 y1 and you have z1 so could we find the dynamic equations of this robot how to proceed how are we going to do it what is the mass matrix Yes. Uh, the first one would be the uh, the first. Well, well, starting from the from the end, you want to say the uh, mass of the second link times the distance from the. So, I mean, w we found the mass matrix is the sum from i equal to one to n of m i j v i transpose j v i plus omega so we, we can just take that expression and just write it okay write it out you can you can start from the end from but basically you need to compute this okay do you agree with this I mean this is what we we we, we established so let, let's just write the equation so what do we need to do in this equation now what is missing we need to compute these j v i's and j omega i's right how do we compute j v i we need p c i the vector locating the center of mass do you see that vector well it is there you have to be careful how you you write it so the p c one is do you agree? L1 cosine 1 and L1 sine 1, you agree? If anyone doesn't agree, please make sure. Well, sometimes there are mistakes, so there is no minuses. No? Everyone agrees. Okay. Okay, now once you have the p vector, you do the partial derivatives and you compute your Jacobian. All right. The first Jacobian JV1 we compute up to one, so the first column, and add a zero column. The second one we compute up to column two, right? Basically all of them. And now we want to make find the expression m1 jv1 transpose jv1 so you get these two expressions so the first element there is this two by two matrix and the second element is that so the mass matrix is equal to the sum of those four elements the first element is this we have three zeros and just this so mass one the contribution of mass one to the total mass matrix appears here what is this if everything was zero this is telling you that the center of mass of mass one multiplied by its distance to the axis gives you some inertia and this is the contribution of the center of mass one to the mass matrix right you understand that and that makes sense 
must to contribution is to joint one and its contribution is appearing by the distance square of that center of mass to the axis. Make sense? But mass two has another contribution on the second joint. Okay? So you see how this is, this is added. You start with one element, mass one, and you see its contribution. Mass one will never appear anymore. Mass 2 is going to appear here and here. And in different robots, it will appear also in here, in the coupling. But as it happened, because of the Jacobian, it, it's not going to appear anymore. The inertia. With the Z1 and Z2, we are going to have the Jacobians. Here are the two Jacobians. And when we do the multiplication, we see the contribution of the inertia of link one appears only on joint one. The contribution of the inertia on joint two appears only on joint two because joint two is prismatic. So the total mass matrix is here. So the mass matrix, as it happened for this robot, is decoupled. There is no di uh, of diagonal terms. You can see that M2 is appearing here. M2 is constant, as we said. M2 is representing the inertial properties viewed along axis 2. That is what? If you lock joint 1, you are moving a mass. You see? And that's all what you see. Right? Okay, let's lock joint two and look at joint one. When you rotate about joint one, you're going to see the inertia of joint one, link one and link two. You're going to see the distance of the center of mass by the scales by the mass of one and two. Right? Okay, this is, yes? So why is it that, like the term ML squared looks like an inertia? It is the inertia of the center of, of mass uh, when, when you are looking at the linear motion, and then you have the angular motion bringing all the rest of the contribution of the inertial properties. You have both of them. And, and the, the mass M1 which represent the mass of the link at the center of mass brings in a uh, in, uh, for a revolute joint uh, brings a contribution to the inertial uh, forces by the square. It has to be, I mean, to be uh, uh, homogeneous in units, you, 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 you basically need distance square. So you have M1, L2 plus all the rest of the contribution of the inertia of the link because it is, it is a rigid body and we computed its inertia already. The next question is, what about how this is varying? As we move this M2, as we extend the location of M2, this is function of the distance. You see that? So it's varying. Okay. We don't have much time, but I think we can do the centrifugal Coriolis forces. So we need to compute Bijks. All right, so I said it is simple, and I didn't say why. It is really simple because there are a lot of things that just disappear. What about these MIJKs? What, what things you, you, you would remember from what we said? We said something about this, like, element MNN is independent of any variable. M22 is function of M22 is function of the configuration. So, if you take the partial derivative of M22 with respect to joint one, you are going to have zero. Joint two, zero. It's function of three, four, and and the rest. So, 
many of those elements, like if I take ij with respect to a k larger than i, then it's going to be zero. And that leads to properties that all the biiis are zero, all the bijis are zero for i greater of, uh, uh, than j, and in our robot, the only variable is just m11, the only element that is changing. So with m11, we have only to consider the, the, its, uh, its derivative with respect to 2. That means that we have only m112 that is non-zero. And m112 is simply, the element was m2 d, d2 squared, so it will be 2m2 d2. And when we write the matrices, that appears like this. So it appears in the B matrix and it appears in the C matrix. So there, there are indeed centrifugal forces uh, that will appear. And the matrix V appears like this. Could you tell me where the centrifugal forces are appearing? Which joint is going to have to see the effect of centrifugal forces? Joint two. Because you can see here, you have theta dot two multiplied by this, and this goes to V2. You see that? Which joint will have Coriolis forces? Which joint? Louder. Joint? Can, can you read? This is a vector. You multiply this by the top. It goes to V1. So V1 has a centrifugal, joint 1 has a uh, uh, Coriolis force, and joint 2 has a centrifugal force. And it's very easy. If you rotate this, you see that M2 will, will, will start going away, and that is joint 2, centrifugal. And the first one is the product of velocities, Coriolis. Okay, so the V vector is like this. The gravity vector is already there because we already know JV1 and JV2, just you compute it. Be careful on your gravity vector. It is pointing down along the minus y direction. And this is your vector. So when we are in this configuration, the center of mass 1 and 2 at their distances will produce a force projected with the cosine and the, on the joint 2 we have only M2 that is affecting the gravity. And finally here is your model. Wow! On time! Okay, now we can use it next time. See you on Monday. <laughs>